Well, welcome to our Calvary Baptist Church Bible Institute. I'm glad you can join us today. And we are continuing in Basic Bible Doctrine 2. And today we are, we are looking at the doctrine of salvation, and that is soteriology. And you spell that S-O-T-E-R-I-O-L-O-G-Y. S-O-T-E-R-I-O-L-O-G-Y, which is the doctrine, okay? It is the doctrine of salvation. Um, so there's some key scriptures um, that I'll point out to you, just a couple of here. And I've, I've tried to put today's lesson here on the board. I hope you're able to see that, but I'll point out a few things as we look at the greatness of salvation and the basis of salvation. All right, so the doctrine of soteriology is the doctrine of salvation. Um, Luke 19.10 says, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ came, okay? He came to seek and to save that which is lost. In John chapter 10, verse number 28, um, this is one of the great proof texts for eternal salvation. Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Romans 5, 1 says, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and of course, in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, and the Bible tells us, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And then in 1 John 2, 2, it says, he is the propitiation for our sins, um, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the world. In our Calvary Baptist Church Bible study, we, we looked at this one verse today, 1 John 2, 2, um, about the fact that Jesus Christ is the propitiation for our sins. And that's one of the key words that we're going to hopefully cover today, the word propitiation. So we'll get, we'll get right into this here. We'll get right into this in this doctrine of salvation. Soteriology, it is the doctrine of salvation. Here's a few things to keep in mind by means of introduction. Uh, number one, salvation is the supreme mission of Jesus Christ. Again, in Luke 19, 10, we read, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Uh, that is the supreme mission of Jesus Christ. That verse refutes the social gospel. Uh, Jesus Christ did not come to improve the lives of people, to, to make lives better. No, Jesus Christ came to rescue us from our sins. If he did not come, if, we, if he did not come, we would be lost forever. So the Lord Jesus Christ came to deliver us, to save us from our sins. Uh, secondly, uh, salvation is the central theme of God's word. In 1 Peter chapter number 1, in 1 Peter chapter number 1 and verses 10 and 11, we read this of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. So salvation is the central theme of God's word. Um, I have a book uh, that, that I've read a couple of times. I'll probably read it again. And uh, the book is entitled The Unfolding Drama of Redemption. And that book was written by Dr. Scroggy. And uh, I guess he took about 50 years in compiling this book. 
and he shows how how uh, man began in a garden and ultimately you know it, it leads to a city and, and so forth but it's called the unfolding drama of redemption because right from the very beginning um, God God has has sought to to reconcile mankind to bring sinners to himself and it's an, an, it's an unfolding um, it, it begins you know obviously in seed form in Genesis 3 and verse number 15 and, and then it develops and becomes fully developed in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ it's a great book uh, it's well worth the investment uh, you can certainly find it pretty much through anywhere um, so salvation and, and so the unfolding drama of redemption, meaning the, the, the redemption that, that God wants man to have is found in the Bible. It's the theme of God's word. And then salvation, of course, is the need of every human being. Every single person needs the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so the greatness of salvation. All right, um, I'd like for you to turn to uh, Hebrews, Hebrews chapter number two, please. Hebrews chapter number two. <clears throat> and we'll look at one verse, verse number three. All right, Hebrews chapter two and verse number three. And... It says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Notice that the writer of Hebrews says, so great, so great salvation. Okay, salvation is the greatest, right? So the greatness of salvation, I hope you can see it. I hope the glare is not too bad. Uh, the greatness of salvation, and I'm going to give you, I guess, about six or seven reasons. There's many reasons, but six or seven reasons as to why salvation is, is great. Number one, salvation is great because of its divine author, because of its divine author. Okay, salvation is is not man's idea. Salvation is God's eternal plan. Okay, look with me in Ephesians, and we'll do our best to compare Scripture with Scripture here. Okay, but Ephesians chapter 1, and we'll take a look at verses 3 through 6. And while you're turning there, and, and as I said, that salvation is not man's idea but it's God's eternal plan uh, remember that in Jonah 2 9 we read that salvation is of the Lord it is of God okay God's eternal plan is salvation so in Ephesians chapter 1 beginning in verse 3 we read blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, God's choosing, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children. He's made us his children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved." So salvation is according to uh, the praise of the glory of his grace. That's, that's why salvation is so great, because it's of, <clears throat> it's of God's grace. It's because uh, the fact that he, God himself, is the divine author of salvation. Secondly, or letter B, okay, salvation is great because of the price paid to procure it, the price that was paid to procure our salvation. Look with me in First Peter. First Peter, chapter number one, please. Uh, 
1 Peter chapter 1 in verses 18 and 19. Salvation is great because of the price that was paid to procure it. <clears throat> the incredible high cost of the blood of Jesus Christ. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers, verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ, the precious blood of Christ, okay, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. There is, there is no higher cost than the blood of Jesus Christ. What makes our salvation so great is the price that was paid to procure it. And the price that was paid to procure our salvation was the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Number three, or letter C, salvation is so great because of its universality. Okay, because of its universality, it is for, for all languages, cultures, every race, <coughs> for out, for out all of time. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter number 45, please. Isaiah chapter 45, and look if you would in uh, verse number 22. Actually, verse number 21, we'll keep it in the... In the context, Isaiah 45, verses 21 and 22 says, Tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior, and there is none beside me. And here's the universality of salvation. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is none else. And Isaiah says, look unto me, all the ends of the earth. And, and that, that is for all languages, for all people, Jew, Gentile alike. And uh, this, uh, this verse is what um, God used in the life of young Charles Haddon Spurgeon when, when Spurgeon came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You ought to read about the account of his conversion as a, as a young, young man about age 15 and so forth on his way to church one snowy evening and Providence kept him from coming to the church that he wanted to. He ended up at a little primitive um, Methodist Church, I believe. Uh, anyway, there was a handful of people in there. It had been snowing. The preacher couldn't come, and a little layman came up, a little cobbler, and he, he quoted this verse. That's all he did. And uh, <clears throat> Spurgeon said as he, as he looked in the back, he had this, this miserable feeling about himself. He, he knew he was undone. He knew he was lost. And, and God um, used this verse in his soul the preacher said to, to young Spurgeon, young man, uh, you look miserable and you need to obey my voice. And Spurgeon said, I kept looking and I kept looking and I kept looking to Christ crucified on the cross. And he says, as he looked, as he looked, he said his sin, and the, the whole veil of sin that had been covering his life had been lifted, had been taken away. Christ saved his soul. And the universality of it makes salvation so great. Okay, uh, letter D here, the greatness of it. Okay, uh, salvation is great because of its eternal duration. Okay, it is forever. It is forever. In John chapter 10, verses 28 and 29, our salvation never fades. Uh, it never uh, decreases. It never wavers. Uh, it never weakens. Um, it, it's, uh, it never ends. It's eternal. I give unto them eternal life. Um, the life that Christ has and is. He is life eternal. And he imparts that life unto us. It is, it is forever. So it is great because of its eternal duration. Letter E. 
Okay. Um, salvation is great because it came to us personified. Salvation is great because it came to us personified. Salvation is not in something, but in someone. That's what it means. It came to us personified. Okay, it is not in something. Salvation is not by works. Salvation is not because we've been baptized or anything like that. Salvation is personified. It came to us in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look with me in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy and chapter uh, <clears throat> number, number 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12. And here, here we read, Paul said this, For the thing, excuse me, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed against, unto him against that day. So Paul said, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. And he is speaking there about the person of Jesus Christ. Okay, so salvation is great <clears throat> because it came personified. It's, it's, not, it's not in a, in a system. <clears throat> um, it's not in, um, certainly not of works. Um, it is not... Um, by man accomplishing something and then God saying, well, you've done that well, boom, here's my salvation. No, it's, it's entirely, entirely in the person of Jesus Christ. So when we read in the word of God, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. He is speaking, of course, about the person of Jesus Christ. So salvation is great because it came to us personified. Letter F, okay, letter F. Salvation is great because of its benefits, because of its benefits. And there are many wonderful things that accompany salvation. Um, let's look in Psalm 103, please. Psalm 103. Hmm? Psalm 103. And verses uh, 1 and 2. So here's a Psalm of David. <clears throat> Psalm 103, verses 1 and 2. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And he says in verse number three, who forgiveth all our iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. There are so many wonderful benefits that accompany our salvation. Um, boy, I tell you, you just, all the words, uh, we're studying soteriology, but there is salvation, right? There is <clears throat> forgiveness of sin. Um, our sins are as far as east is from west. Um, God has purged our sins. Um, we have redemption through the blood. Um, there, there's conversion. Um, <clears throat> there's redemption. There is reconciliation, right? We've been reconciled. Um, there's um, regeneration, right? The washing of the word through regeneration. And, and so many forgiveness of sins, I said, but there's so, so many wonderful benefits that accompany our salvation. Um, it's an amazing thing, okay? It's an amazing thing. All right, so <clears throat> the greatness of salvation, okay? The greatness of salvation. Uh, let's take a look at Roman numeral number two, the basis, the basis of salvation. <clears throat> so the question is, how is salvation possible, okay? 
The only way salvation is possible is because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this is the basis of our salvation. Look with me in Hebrews chapter number 9, please. Hebrews chapter number 9. So in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22 says this. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood and without shedding of blood is no remission. Okay. The basis of salvation. Okay. The basis of salvation. The price uh, or the only way that salvation is possible was because of the death <coughs> and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So Christ died in in our place he was crucified he paid the penalty for for sin for our sin okay he was buried and this is according to 1 Corinthians 15 1 through 4 okay and he arose that's that's simple that that is the gospel message the death burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ so Christ truly died. He truly died on the cross. Okay? Um, he did not faint or swoon or pass out and then revive again in the coolness of the tomb and in his weakened condition, right? Roll that stone away that had been sealed by Pilate soldier, soldiers and escape into the early morning or, or whatnot. That, those are, that's a fallacy. Okay, Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary. Okay, he was placed in Joseph's new tomb. He was there three days, three days and nights. He was there in the tomb three days. On the third day, okay, he triumphantly uh, arose from the dead. Okay, he is alive. Okay, he is alive. He showed himself alive by many infallible proofs. Um, 1 Corinthians 15 is the great resurrection chapter in the New Testament. And <clears throat> for 40 days he was with his disciples in his post-resurrection ministry. He led the disciples to the Mount of Olives. And on that 40th day, he ascended into heaven <clears throat> in bodily form, his glorified body where he is now seated at the Father's right hand. Okay, so Jesus Christ, he is our advocate. He's our advocate. Jesus Christ is our great high priest in heaven. Okay? So the basis of, of salvation is not because we merit any part of it. We don't. That's why grace is grace. Okay, we don't merit or we don't earn the grace of God. Salvation has been provided for entirely in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the basis of it, the basis of it is because of his death and his resurrection. So there are four key aspects of the death of Christ that's taught in the scripture. And because his death accomplished these things, <clears throat> it is possible to have salvation. Number one, okay, is this. I hope you can see it. Substitution. Um, what, what does that mean? Okay, well, it means that Christ's death was vicarious. In other words, he died in our place. He died in our place. And I want to look at these references here. Okay, Christ actually died in our place. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, please. 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. <clears throat> so 1 Corinthians 5 and verse number 7 says this. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened, for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. 
Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Look in 1 Timothy chapter number 2. <clears throat> and verse number 6, or actually verse number 5 and 6. We read, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. He gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Then turn with me to Titus chapter number 2. <clears throat> Verse 14 says, Who gave himself for us. This is substitution that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Right? So the first word for the basis of our salvation, meaning that his, his death accomplished this, is the word substitution. Okay? Simply means this, that he died in our place. He gave himself for us, the just for the unjust. The second key word is the word redemption. The word redemption. The word redeem means bought and delivered on the basis of a paid price. Okay? In other words, Christ paid the redemption price for all mankind and the price was his own shed blood. Okay. Um, let's, um, let's turn back, if you would, to the Gospel of Mark, please. And uh, <clears throat> Mark chapter number 10. Mark chapter number 10. Mark chapter 10 and verse number 45 <clears throat> says this. For even the Son of Man came, for even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom, okay, a ransom for many, um, to redeem, okay, to pay, to pay the price. Um, turn, if you would, to Revelation <clears throat> chapter number five, please. <clears throat> Revelation chapter number five. And verses 9 and 10. And um, <clears throat> here's where the elders worship because of redemption. Verse 9 and 10, Revelation 5. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood. Amen. Amen out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. Wow, that's, that's, that's redemption, okay? That's redemption. So it means bought and delivered on the basis of a paid price. Christ paid the redemption price for all mankind and the price was his own blood, okay? So the basis of salvation these, these four great words, substitution, right? Christ took our place, redemption. He paid the price with his own blood. And the next word is the word, letter C, reconciliation. Okay, reconciliation. And to reconcile means to make peace between two parties. Um, as it pertains to soteriology, it means to be rendered savable, okay? So, so to make peace between two parties. Um, there's two references that I'd like for us to look at. The first is in Romans chapter number five. Romans chapter number five, please. Uh, Romans chapter five, and uh, let's see. <clears throat> Verse number 10, uh, back in verse number nine. 
Verse number 8, actually. Okay, verses 8 through 10. Romans 5, verses 8 through 10. It says, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Right there we see substitution. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. There we see redemption, the blood. And in verse number 10, okay, for if we were, excuse me, for when we were enemies, past tense, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So, so it means to make peace between two parties. All right, so we are reconciled. We are reconciled to God through the death of Jesus Christ. We, we can come now to God. We've been brought near to God through the death of Jesus Christ. Uh, look, if you would, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 18 through 20. We read this. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed us <clears throat> unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. That is the word of reconciliation that God has given to the church. So reconcile means to make peace between two parties. Um, so we have these basis of salvation, substitution. Christ died in our place. Uh, redemption. Christ paid the price through his blood, reconciliation. He, he reconciled us. He's made peace on our behalf. And then there's one more word here. It's the word propitiation. The word propitiation. And simply put, the word propitiation means to satisfy the angered holiness of God by means of a sacrifice. The death of Christ satisfied God eternally. There is nothing the sinner can do to satisfy God. He is already satisfied with the sacrifice of his son. <clears throat> First John 2, verse number 2, verse 1 and 2 says this, My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So the word propitiation simply means to satisfy the angered holiness of God by means of a sacrifice. Uh, that <clears throat> when Christ was on the cross... He was being punished for our sin. He, was, he took our place. And, and God laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was punished in our place. And at the same time, the blood of Jesus flowed from his body. His blood was shed. And it was through the blood that the angered holiness of God has been completely satisfied. You know, in the Old Testament, there was the Ark of the Covenant and it was made of wood, but it was overlaid with pure gold. And the high priest would enter in with blood, and he would, he would sprinkle the blood before the mercy seat and upon the mercy seat. Um, in, that, in that ark, there was the broken law. And <clears throat> when that blood was sprinkled, God accepted, God accepted that particular sacrifice. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ was 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 God's propitiation and and he 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 was made sin for us okay he was made sin for us and the solution the solution to to our sin okay the only way of salvation the solution to it is the cross of calvary 
through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, through his uh, atoning work, uh, his atoning work on the, on the cross, okay? The angered holiness of God has been ever for, forever satisfied. Our salvation is, is, the basis of it is entirely by grace through faith. It isn't anything that we can accomplish. We can't. We can't accomplish it, okay? It is finished, was the cry of the Lord Jesus in John 19, 30. Okay, so the full, the full price for redemption and for reconciliation and substitution, okay, the basis of it was the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, <clears throat> uh, next time, as uh, so we continue in soteriology, we're going to look at the motive and the means um, and probably the scope of salvation as well. well thank you for joining us.